Next presenter is Joshua McClure, a CEO of Maxwell, Maxwell Biosciences. And uh, just to let the audience know, this uh, startup won our uh, first prize, right? At the last uh, conference, uh, Innovator MD uh, Global Summit. So this is an amazing uh, innovation that is coming to us. And Joshua, the stage is yours. Thank you, Lee. Good to be here. I'm Joshua McClure, as he said. I'm CEO with over 20 years of experience, and I'm excited to tell you about Maxwell Biosciences and our Clarimer Biomimetic Small Molecules. Our patented Clarimer compounds are poised to revolutionize the pharmaceutical industry as a one drug for many bugs solution that could replace current global use of antibiotics, antivirals, and antifungals with a single compound. Our disclaimer, uh, Maxwell started oh, with Joshua, a few. I'm so sorry, yeah. your, your, your screen isn't being shared at this time. Oh, I'm, I'm sure sorry. Have a presentation. Perfect. There you go. Can you see that? That's great. Okay, great. All right, so let's go back. Uh, let's we'll start with this, uh, this first slide so you can see that. Uh, we're backed by over $40 million in government grants and awards. And uh, we've uh, had some successful NIAID work as well with COVID-19, both prophylactic and therapeutic. There's our disclaimer. So Maxwell started with a few big what ifs. After my own family was impacted by various infectious pathogens, uh, what if we could create a synthetic immune system by mimicking and enhancing the properties of natural immune molecules? What if we could create a fully synthetic, highly stable, highly scalable, clinically viable platform technology? I'm happy to share that Maxwell Biosciences has developed the Clarimer platform solution over the past seven years, a novel class of biostable small molecules that can mimic and improve upon any peptide in the body. We're starting with mimicry of the human cathelicidin antimicrobial peptide. Since this cathelicidin peptide is like a Swiss army knife of the immune system used to fight all pathogens. Using nature as a guide, Clarimers, which are not antibiotics, have been developed as a one drug for many bugs solution with enhanced potency, safety, and stability to address the most serious untreatable infectious disease threats from viral, bacterial, and fungal pathogens including challenging biofilm formations. I don't have time to share all of the data in this short 10 minute presentation, but you should know that Maxwell Science is backed by over 250 peer reviewed publications with over $40 million in grants awarded mostly to independent investigators from universities and governments around the world. Fauci's team at NIAID confirmed our Clarimers as an effective one drug for many bug solution against all tested strains of coronaviruses like SARS-1, SARS-CoV-2, and MERS, and all tested strains of influenza. Other studies conducted with Clarimers show that they are effective against all enveloped viruses. We have tested including HSV-1 and 2 and hepatitis B and C, and we just got some really good results back on Ebola, which we're very excited about. If you're wondering how this is possible, confirmed study data shows this is accomplished by targeting phosphatidylserine, which is exposed in the outer membrane in many pathogens, all enveloped viruses, and is not exposed in healthy human cells. The exposed phosphatidylserine is what your immune system peptides target. Maxwell's clamors mimic that with high potency, completely inactivating the pathogen while avoiding healthy human cells. And you don't have to take our word for it. The University of Texas Medical Branch used an electron microscope to confirm viral membrane disruption by our clamors as a key mechanism of action. And here's that electron microscope images in greater detail. So those images confirm that clamors are highly selective in targeting pathogen membranes the same way our human immune system does. This example shows the membrane disruption of two viral pathogens, both enveloped viruses, a DNA and an RNA virus. Other study, studies conducted with bacteria by Stanford University's Barron Lab further show that after clamors disrupt the pathogen membrane, they aggregate the internal organelles to freeze metabolism and bind the nucleic acids, thus inactivating the pathogen and also blocking drug resistance. 
Maxwell's Claremer solution provides a strong possibility to replace global antibiotic use and end antibiotic pollution. Thanks to their proprietary mechanisms of action, studies show that claremers are much less susceptible to the development of bacterial resistance than conventional antibiotics like gentamicin shown here. The positive impact of reducing antimicrobial drug resistance has great potential for humanity and Maxwell aims to be a leader in this field. There is significant preclinical safety data showing claremers, including this study showing the compounds are well tolerated in vivo. When tested in animals at over 100 times the therapeutic dose, claremers still cause no toxicity. And our lead claremer compound does not cause the release of any pro-inflammatory cytokines evaluated here. In addition to safety data, there's also strong preclinical efficacy data. So to start, the NIH completed a gold standard hamster study last year, and they confirmed in, in vivo safety and efficacy of claremers as both a prophylactic and prevents all symptoms of COVID and is a post-infection uh, therapeutic that shortens the recovery time for COVID, potentially eliminating long COVID. For bacterial efficacy, this study from Texas A&M examined the safe, effective treatment of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in mice. Results show that the Claremer drug candidates are able to effectively target infections of the lung. Our Claremers, our Claremers show high levels of e efficacy against both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, and once again, they demonstrate the ability to avoid the development of resistance. The work of Dr. Corey, a medical doctor at the Daniel Duncan Comprehensive Cancer Center at the Baylor College of Medicine, helps showcase our fungal efficacy, the same compound. Dr. Corey works with immunocompromised cancer patients, and he often watches his pa patients slowly die, not just from cancer, but from opportunistic fungal infections of the upper respiratory tract. These types of infections are currently untreatable and are often deadly. After a decade of clinical research, Dr. Corey finally found success using Maxwell's Claremer compounds, which were the first to show both safety and efficacy in mouse models of immunosuppressed fungal infections of the upper respiratory system. There's verified data from Dr. Corey's lab showing a significant 80% reduction in fungal units sampled from the lungs of these completely immunosuppressed mice. This is breakthrough data and nothing has ever shown anything like this before. And remember, Maxwell is a platform biotech company producing compounds with many advantages over competitors, such as low toxicity, high potency, in both in vivo and shelf stability, novel mechanisms of action that help avert the development of drug resistance and relatively low cost of goods with scalable manufacturing. Maxwell has strong IP, including a growing patent portfolio, which we own outright. And the Maxwell's team is extremely experienced in pharma drug discovery and development. A good example is Ed Rudnick, our COO and head of R&D. With over 30 years of experience in drug discovery and commercialization, Ed was the US head of R&D for Shire Pharmaceuticals and has brought some of his former Shire colleagues to Maxwell. In addition, Maxwell has built a world-class scientific advisory board Our team is focused on serious unmet medical needs that optimize our chance for FDA prioritization and emergency use authorization. Chronic rhinositis is our strategic lead program suffered by around 12% of the population. I'm sure everyone here uh, knows someone with chronic rhinositis. It's a huge indication. We've heard from MDs that CRS is a very challenging indication since there are currently no approved drugs to effectively to treat this type of infection. Our single lead drug candidate shows preclinical efficacy against all chronic rhinosatosis bugs tested. So once again, one drug for many bugs. Testing is going well for chronic rhinosatositis indication and our pre-IND response from the FDA is on track for this quarter. In fact, it should come in next month. We're targeting Q3 2023 for our IND application and Q4 of this year to start our phase one human trials. Maxwell has achieved several world first milestones that de-risk our technology, including achievement of scalable manufacturing, and we look forward to getting feedback from medical doctors as we continue towards clinical trials. As Maxwell transitions to become a clinical stage company later this year, our business model is designed to generate revenues from royalties, licensing deals, and spin-out ventures. We plan to IPO around 2026 or maybe earlier. We have a reverse merger opportunity right now with multiple drugs generating pre-IPO revenues. 
As a biotech platform company, preclinical companies similar to ours have recent IPO comparables with pre-money valuations upwards of 1 billion, and these valuations reflect more moderate market conditions prior to the recent biotech bubble. After IPO, we're looking to be evaluated as one of the world's top drug discovery platforms. An independent analysis was recently completed by a biotech market analyst at PH Partners, an investment bank, that estimated Maxwell's implied enterprise value using a net present value model with significant discounting for our preclinical stage, as you can see here, using only the top three antivirals on the market, so none of our fungicidal or bacterial uh, bactericidal therapeutics. So Maxwell's implied enterprise value here is estimated at 7 billion. That's more than a 70x multiple in comparison to the $94 million pre-money valuation that our current convertible note opportunity is listed at. We're currently raising 120 million with, uh, with the first tranche here. Uh, you can see, uh, I'm sorry, with the second tranche there, that uh, is what we would raise in the, uh, the large Series A. Uh, we're looking uh, to raise uh, sort of runway money to cover overhead in our initial uh, IND qualifying studies uh, from this group. So don't worry if you don't have $100 million. <laughs> uh, so the immediate use of funds will uh, be to support research studies and manufacturing scale up in preparation for our anticipated FDA clinical trials later this year. So here are the key takeaways. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Joshua. Um... There are a couple of questions in the chat, but uh, anybody can unmute themselves and ask the question. Uh, great presentation. I have one question. Um, so with the with the grant program and 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 you know you raised a lot of money through that. Um, why do you want to raise you know uh, equity? money why can't you run with the grants and, and continue to do that yeah that's a good question so uh the the grants fund research only they don't fund salaries they don't fund uh, those sort of things so the the 40 million dollars just come to mostly independent investigators around the world so th those uh, grant funds go directly to those labs sometimes we get a little piece of it but mostly not uh, so that just funds the research in that lab i see and um, so how much actual money are you raising now from, yeah, from so small We're raising about 120 million. Uh, we're looking to raise 100 uh, in a series A, and that'll fund us all the way through uh, phase three uh, clinical trials. Uh, and then, uh, and that also uh, funds machine learning and deep learning uh, for structure activity relationships and, uh, and moving into other types of peptides that we can mimic. Uh, immediately what we're raising is around $8 million to cover our uh, IND qualifying studies. So it's about $2 million uh, just to purchase the compounds. And then uh, another uh, $3 million for the various different uh, tox studies, and et cetera, to use those drugs. And then another $3 million to cover overhead and salaries and rent and all that sort of thing. So total of about $8 million that we need uh, over the next uh, six months to a year or so. And, and that'll get you to the next milestone, I'm guessing, right? The $8 million, yes. So that, that gets us into uh, and covers the phase one uh, as well. Okay, got it. Any other questions for Joshua? I have a question, if I may. Go ahead. Um, uh, thank you again, uh, Joshua. I appreciate very much for uh, the opportunity to be here and uh, thank you very much. Uh, you being a great leader. A question about the uh, clinical trial. Would you be able to give uh, a little bit more detail uh, what is the um, outlook, particularly in 2023 and 2024? Sure. Uh, so assuming that we can raise this $8 million here pretty soon, then it'll be, uh, we'll be going into phase one human trials in uh, the end of this year. Um, and then we've got a really interesting phase two program, which is, it's a progressive uh, phase two. 
So instead of waiting, generally what happens is, uh, is between phase two and phase three, you have about a year where, uh, where you have to like, kind of redo everything, go back to the FDA, qualify for the phase three, et cetera. Or what we're planning to do for the phase two is, uh, is essentially ramp up our phase two. So, uh, so give the FDA more data on as, how the phase two is going, and then they stay on top of it with us and they just allow us to recruit more and more patients into the phase two. So we have more long-term data on the phase two uh, patients. And then also it saves us about a year of time and as opposed to doing a phase two and a phase three separately. Is this- uh, And that's, uh, those, are, those are planned for 2024. Is the human trial up, will be doing only in the US? or simultaneously outside the US as well. So Mary just reminded me that our chief medical officer, Tony uh, Verco is, uh, is here. So he can, uh, he oh, can answer some of these questions for you, the clinical stuff. Yeah, um, so the, the plan will actually be to run two, ultimately two, two pivotal trials. One will probably be US based and then one, well, one will definitely be US based. The other one, Will probably be Europe, and we'll probably extend that out out into the Asian countries, uh, China and uh, and uh, and India, for instance, and probably also South Africa at some point or another in South America. So we can get a, a wide diversity of the uh, um, of outcomes for that. Yeah, and, and, and part of that is there's there are you know multiple bacteria, multiple uh, types of fungus in different types of the world, right? And so we want to we want to look at those geographies and see how the medicine performs in the various different uh, geographies. It is, can we say um, so far, based on all the data we have, the human trial looks very promising. Can we say that? Uh, I would say that our, our preclinical data looks uh, good for qualifying for the IND. We've, uh, we've submitted our pre-IND uh, paperwork and um, we're very lucky in getting a response from the FDA to say that they will actually meet with us for our uh, pre-IND. So that's about 50% of companies right now are getting are being declined uh, for the pre-IND and just saying you have to go straight into the IND. So that helps us a lot. So that's, that is promising that the FDA is working with us prior to the investigational uh, new drug application to kind of coach us on what it is that they would like to see going into the IND. So that's very promising. And and Tony and Josh, just a question uh, with the with the massive spectrum that that this compound can potentially help. I'm wondering, does that narrow the opportunities for you to either find an orphan drug designation or um, uh, one of the uh, yeah. you know highly susceptible, albeit rare diseases that are universally fatal, for you to even speed up your FDA route? Yeah. So we have an STTR grant. I'm not sure if you know what that is. That's a, it's a uh, NIH grant uh, that works with a university and with the company. So we have an STTR with Stanford, and we're working on uh, chronic supportive of Titus Media, which is an orphan. Uh, what well, is likely an orphan? Uh, it's not never been de designated, but it qualifies likely as an orphan designation in the United States. So, um, but it's huge uh, globally. Right. So in developing countries, CSOM is the leading cause of pediatric deafness. So um, in the United States, because of antibiotic resistance, it's becoming the leading cause of pediatric deafness uh, because it's a you know, perfect perforated eardrum infection of the middle ear and then antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria. So this is becoming much more common. So it's a growing indication. And so uh, with the same compound that we're using for, uh, for chronic rhinositis, uh, we're uh, looking to go in uh, to the FDA for, uh, for CSOM, chronic supportive uh, otitis media. So there's, there are multiple uh, orphan indications that we can branch off into once we show in phase one that the compound is safe, because it's a first in human uh, compound. So it's a, a completely novel technology uh, that is, it's breakthrough in many different ways. Uh, so uh, the FDA is obviously quite interested, and um, and we've been able to recruit an absolutely amazing team. Uh, Dr. Verco here is um, is uh, specialized in first in human uh, clinical trials. So it's, we're lucky to have uh, Dr. Verco and um, and Dr. Rudnick, who I, who I talked about. He's the inventor of Adderall extended release. 
Uh, he uh, was the clinical uh, lead and uh, development uh, lead all the way uh, through to commercialization for Claritin, which everybody knows, you know, probably everyone has taken Claritin. So, uh, so he's, and he's got multiple other multi-billion dollar uh, blockbusters under his hat too. So uh, we just have an incredible team. And um, I mean, a lot of people don't even understand what an accomplishment it is um, that we have successfully scaled the manufacture of this, right? Because it's a completely novel compound. So you have to go find um, you know, contract development manufacturing organizations that are willing to even work with you when you're a startup, um, when it's a, a brand new type of compound, right? Yeah, well, that's great. I, I heard a trivia fact about Claritin that the year before it went generic, they spent more money advertising Claritin than Anheuser-Busch spent advertising Budweiser. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. With that note, uh, uh, thank you, Joshua and, and, and uh, Maxwell team uh, for being here. And uh, I'm sure you'll get some inquiries uh, from some of our uh, investor folks. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks Joshua. And thank you, really Tony. An honor to be here. Thank you. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, for the rest, Thanks, Joshua, of I mean, I've done. I've done, you know, several of these uh, clinical development programs in my career and brought 12 oncology drugs to the market, including several breakthrough designation drugs oh, while I was with Genentech Roche. Yeah, I'm very curious, um, what is your plan to incorporate some of the decentralized uh, and digital tools to accelerate your phase one and phase two trials, uh, especially since I heard the kind of countries you're going to and the speed with which you would want to uh, complete enrollment on these trials. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So glad we have Dr. Berko here. Go for it. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, you're, you're very right in this. And of course, this is now going, going into, it's coming out of its infancy now and becoming mainstream clinical development. And um, we will take this across the globe in all of our trials. Um, in particular, particularly with reference to CRS, um, part of the um, approval outcomes are, are partly based on objective outcomes, but also a symptomatic outcome. So um, we'll use those digital tools for uh, at the level of the patient, but also at the at the at the statistical level and the modeling level in order to, because of the nature of the nasal compound, for instance, and the PK issues that we have to deal with, that we will generate models for this that we will support our clinical development program by the time we get to market um, go for market approval to do that so um, any particular as a side parallel to that of course is the re the the initiatives now related to real world data and the, the uh, mm -hmm. capturing of that those um, um, components of clinical research that will then support us going forward so yep yeah, um, great. You know, I have tons of experience in this area, so feel free to reach out. I've actually utilized, um, uh, you know, you've and, and digitized a lot of these protocols to be able to help with acceleration of the enrollment on these trials and how to embed a lot of these technologies and real world data. So uh, really interested in connecting with you. If you share your contact in, in the chat, I would love to connect with you. Thank you very much. I will definitely reach out to you because that's a great resource. Thank you. Sure. And uh, Joshua, I don't know if you saw, there was a question about long COVID. Um, and I know you've uh, been on your Twitter feed talking about long COVID and you know, yeah. how our compounds might be impactful there. If you can share. Yeah, I, I had, uh, I've had two post-viral syndromes. So a uh, long, long time ago, about almost 17 years ago, I had West Nile virus and I got a uh, post viral syndrome from that. So I got uh, chronic rhinocytositis. Um, I lost the ability to walk. Um, I couldn't even use a keyboard, um, loss of motor function. And that lasted for a long time. So I had to go to physical therapy and um, it's lasted. So I was long hauler on that virus. And then I got COVID and then I was a long hauler on, uh, on that virus uh, too. So I, uh, went deaf, uh, just had all kinds of problems with, uh, with COVID. And so um, what's interesting to me is that uh, chronic rhinocytositis is a post-viral syndrome. So uh, you get, uh, you know, you get uh, RSV or you get coronavirus or you get rhinovirus and that triggers, uh, you know, the, the infection and, and creates an environment where bacteria and fungus can come in and set up ecosystems. 
And so uh, chronic rhinositis otis is highly correlated to uh, immune dysfunction. So highly correlated to uh, diabetes uh, and uh, to cancer, to, um, to radiation and to chemotherapy. So uh, especially, you know, due to uh, colonization by uh, fungus. So we're all breathing uh, mold spores all the time, um, fungal spores, um, but we don't get infections, right? Why is that? It's because the immune system is working and that peptide LL37 is in those, in the mucosa uh, of the sinuses. And so what our compound does is mimic that, right? So the, um, in post-viral syndrome, you get immune exhaustion and you don't have enough of that peptide. So it turns out my, my family, the reason why I've had this multiple post-viral syndromes multiple times, we don't make enough of that peptide. Uh, so a lot of genetics work uh, showed us that uh, um, that this was the case about seven years ago, and that's why I started the, the company. So I funded the first few years of the company myself. I'm going to make another investment in the company, and uh, and so we believe you know after uh, uh, chronic rhinositis uh, indication will show safety, we can branch out into other uh, post viral syndromes like long COVID and, uh, and post other types of uh, post-viral syndromes. I'm intrigued by the real relationship between post-viral syndromes and diabetes. Uh, I have a friend who claims to have gotten type one diabetes after COVID vaccine. Uh, she, she has had like immuno problems, like even before getting vaccines. And at the same time, she knows somebody who got type one diabetes after getting COVID. So is that something that can be like alleviated in any way? So there's certain types of, you can Google this, you can get on Google Scholar and, and look it up. So look up um, a viral infection of the pancreas duct. So there's certain types of uh, type 1 diabetes uh, that are caused by viral infections of the pancreas duct. And because there's not really anything, there's no really th no real therapeutics uh, for those viruses, then they just treat the symptoms of, of the diabetes. So there's many different triggers for type 1 uh, diabetes. It's not just genetics, uh, but you know, the largest portion is, uh, is familial. So it's, it's quite possible that uh, that you know they whoever your friend is has a viral infection of the pancreas duct i haven't heard of diabetes from the covid from the vaccine uh but i know there's all kinds of uh, there's all kinds of issues that are popping up from the vaccine because you know it was it was uh, authorized and not approved by uh the fda when it first went out so um so we're all kind of you know hundreds of millions of uh, people in the in the phase two trial essentially right well in fact Hello. Hi, Ada. Hi. Um, in fact, I'm one of those uh, people that uh, I got hyperglycemia a uh, few months after I got my COVID. And in fact, my average, uh, what my average uh, glucose level is about 200. And uh, when I discovered that, it was close to the 400. And as it turns out, now it's came down to about 180 right now on the daily basis. Now, what I discovered is actually, uh, because they treated me as a diabetic, but more diabetic medications I was taking, like metformin and things of in the same class, actually my glucose would go up. As it turns out, my through my own research, I find out that actually the virus, uh, or the infection, I should say, the infection affected my delta cells of pancreas. And that causes the abnormal productions of somatostatin. And that causes my liver to produce glucose, elevated glucose in the same time, uh, stopping the productions or reducing the productions of insulin. Mm -hmm. so it's almost like you pushing the gas, you meanwhile holding the uh, brake. Yeah. So, so what's really interesting is the uh, is blood levels of uh, of sugar. So high blood sugar mm -hmm. levels make it very difficult for your body to convert vitamin D 
into LL37. So L, uh, vitamin D is the key upregulator up regulator of this cathelicidin antimicrobial peptide that our compound mimics, right? So, right. Um, so think about it from an evolutionary uh, perspective. Why is it that the viruses are attracted to the pancreas? Well, they're, they're evolutionarily, it makes sense that they would tune the environment of the organism to make it easier for them to stick around, to have less of this peptide, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's, there's, there's some really interesting studies on that and then also oral health. So on the dental side, so, um, so it's, there's really interesting studies on, uh, on the amount of ACE2 inhibitors in the, in the oral uh, cavity as opposed to the lungs, right? So there's actually uh, you know, many orders of mag uh, magnitude more ACE2 receptors in the oral cavity than there are in the lung. Mm -hmm. And so what that's you know, one of the ways they test for it is uh, for COVID is uh, is in the saliva. Right. So uh, so what's really interesting is that oral rinses and um, like antiviral oral rinses and uh, antiviral um, toothpaste, uh, those are showing uh, really interesting results in treating COVID patients. So there's a there's a hospital in uh, Salisbury. You can you can Google this or go on Twitter. And they've just implemented an oral health campaign, first first time in all of uh, the United Kingdom, an oral health campaign for specifically for viral infections for COVID patients. And what they're seeing, their data now is showing, is that these patients are being released from the hospital much sooner um, because they're getting better much faster because they're reducing the viral load in the oral cavity. Uh, and then uh, you know, imagine what that uh, any um, you know bleeding gums or anything like that causes the uh cause the virus then to go systemic and then you get those uh you get what you know a lot of doctors and a lot of uh, scientists are calling the complications right of the vascular system but what they're saying at this doc at this hospital in salisbury is that COVID is essentially vascular is that um it it's after the ace2 receptors which are in the vascular system and in the mouth and that 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 the virus is actually getting mostly into the lungs reverse right through the vascular system going through the the veins uh and and arteries and then uh, and then reaching the deep lung uh that way so uh, i think that's really interesting so um you know viruses are are systemic they're um although um although the the virus itself sars cov2 is airborne uh, it likes to reproduce uh, using the ACE2 receptor. So looking for you know, where those sweet spots, spots are, like in the oral cavity and other places, is you know, if you can disinfect those areas, it's really important. And the easiest place to reach is your, is your nasal system and your, uh, your mouth. And so um, you know, I'll be using that, our nasal spray, I'll be using it in my mouth as well. So. Yeah, and what I was actually started using because I noticed that whenever I was taking metformin, it actually my glucose level would go higher. And I had to stop metformin after about using it about a month in high dosage and uh, started with low dosage. Now, interesting things about it is uh, uh, I discovered that the inflammatory effect is actually comes from the upregulations of new effort. And that causes somatostatin to be produced by delta cells. Now, also in other things that I discovered that uh, using the mineral uh, vanadine is actually works in the same way as insulin without using the insulin receptors at this for time being. Oh, that's so, interesting. I didn't, I yeah, I've been using about 300 milligram of that and about uh, 500 milligram uh, vitamin K2, MK4, MK17 version. Oh yeah, and K2 is comes... very important with uh, with vitamin D. Helps with yeah, the... exactly. Yeah. So this combination actually reduced my glucose within about a week. As I said, it's from the average, uh, not average, but around 300 plus all the way down to about 180 right That's now. Still, and it's still high, but I think that this is anyway. Anyway, so I find this inflammatory pathway was really causing these uh, problems on at least on the delta cells, not alpha cells or no be not beta cells, which is a very interesting part of it. And that kind of led me to start my company on that area, but more on that later. Thank you very much, Sivu. 
Yeah, thank you. So